This is the Convict Australia podcast. Thank you for tuning in. It was a crisp Monday morning in spring, 1828, when the bank teller descended the stairs into the basement room of the Bank of Australia. The doors of the bank, located in George Street, Sydney, had not yet opened for business. As he made his way downstairs, he could hear the other bank tellers busily preparing for business above him. He didn't bother with a light, as he had left the float in a spot before he clocked off late Saturday night, a spot that was easily reached in the dark. He knew the building well by now and had made this same movement countless times. It was his daily routine. He reached out and placed his hand on the spot where he had left the money and his heart skipped a beat as his hand failed to locate the bag. In a panic, he groped around and felt the blood drain from his body. Adrenaline kicked in and he scurried to light the room. When the room came into view, he hurriedly looked about, hoping that the money had fallen to the ground. But to his horror, he discovered that the room was in disarray and there was a hole in the foundation wall. The bank had been robbed. In no time at all, the directors and police had been notified and news of the robbery began sweeping through the town of Sydney. A thorough search of the strong room was conducted and revealed that around £14,000 had been stolen in banknotes, British silver coins and Spanish dollars. The robbers had left behind large quantities of gold and the bulk of the silver coins, and it was assumed that they were too heavy for the thieves to carry away. Upon investigation of the hole that had been chiselled through the nine feet thick foundation wall, police discovered that it led to a drain that ran from Essex Street, under George Street, under Redmond's pub, to Sydney Cove. In it was a trail of things that the robbers had left behind. This included a crowbar, a sword saw, a sounder, a tinder box and steel, a broken lantern, a lamp and a bottle of oil, some empty bottles of rum and a gill measure. There was also a trail of coins. The town was abuzz with excitement about the discovery. Sydney siders were astonished that thieves could have pulled off such a huge heist. It was all anyone was talking about. If you had somehow not heard about it through the grapevine, then you read about it on the front page in the newspaper. What had everyone talking was the reward of £100 offered by the directors of the bank. People began questioning if they had seen something and rumours were rife. Naturally, the authorities were quick to suspect a convict was guilty of the crime. Just two days after the discovery of the missing fortune, the Sydney Gazette published a proclamation from the Governor Ralph Darling on the front page of their newspaper promising an absolute pardon to any prisoner of the Crown who came forward with information that would lead to the discovery and conviction of the robbers. They surmised that it had to be a group of thieves and owing to the tools that were needed to carry out such a job, they brought in a number of stonemasons for questioning. The directors of the bank were so desperate for the money to be returned, they took further measures to try and catch the thieves. A few days after the robbery, they released new notes and gave the public a window of opportunity to bring in their old notes for exchange for the new ones. The public was warned not to accept payment with old notes. On top of the £100 reward for any information resulting in the apprehension and conviction of the robbers, the directors also offered free passage to England for the informant. As enticing as these rewards were, police were still no closer to capturing the offenders. On the 24th of September, the Board of Directors published in the Sydney Gazette the list of numbers of the £50 notes that were stolen, cautioning the public not to accept these notes for payment. They also increased the reward again. Along with an absolute pardon, 
£100 reward and a free passage to England, they offered the informant 5% of the total amount recovered in stolen money. Two days later, £150 of the stolen money was found concealed in an outhouse in a yard in Cumberland Street. The Australian newspaper reported that police were questioning 10 individuals about it, but after extensive questioning, no charges were laid. There simply was not enough evidence to make an arrest. More than two years passed without police being any closer to solving the mystery until finally one of the thieves came forward and confessed. His name was William Blackstone. He had been transported to Australia with a sentence of 14 years and arrived on board the Mariner. Blackstone had been in and out of trouble since his arrival and had several stints in the penal settlement in Newcastle and felt the lash across his back. He was considered to be a bad character by authorities. After robbing the bank, he found himself in trouble again and was sent to the notorious Norfolk Island. He was so desperate to get away and was glad to be chosen as a witness in the Adam Oliver murder trial and sent to Sydney. But faced with returning to Norfolk Island and the anger he felt at his accomplices for not giving him his cut of the loot, when pressed, he confessed his part in the bank robbery and gave up everyone who was involved. He wanted revenge for their betrayal and the reward of an absolute pardon. He had had enough of living like this and realised that he had nothing to lose. Blackstone stood before Mr Justice Dowling and the jury on Friday the 10th of June 1831. As Blackstone began to answer questions, the jury took in his brown hair and hazel eyes, his heavily tattooed arms and his rather generously proportioned nose. He was a man that he didn't forget in a hurry. Blackstone's story began in mid-August when two fellow convicts named Dingle and Farrell came to his house one night and shared with him their plan to rob the Bank of Australia. At the time, Blackstone had only been in Sydney for six months and claimed not to have even known where the bank was. James Dingle was a shoemaker from Dublin who had been transported in 1815 on the Dorothy with a sentence of seven years for stealing. Nearly two years prior to the robbery, Dingle had earned himself a certificate of freedom. He had been in his late twenties when he had arrived at Blackstone's house that fateful night. With his young friend George Farrell in tow, he tossed a small stone onto the roof of the house to attract Blackstone's attention. Farrell was also from Dublin and had been sentenced to seven years for theft. Farrell had been in and out of trouble since his arrival in 1822. He'd experienced many of the punishments that the courts had to offer. He'd done time on the treadmill, been worked in leg irons for three months and, after being discovered drunk and disorderly, had lost his privilege of being able to sleep outside of the barracks. Blackstone listened as Dingle described his plan of breaking into the bank. Dingle had assured him it could be done, as he had it on good authority from his mate Thomas Turner, a convict who had been employed to build the strong room of the bank, that it could be breached by tunnelling through a drain. He admitted that he was sceptical at first, but later agreed after Dingle's persuasive arguments. Dingle then gave him a list of tools that he needed Blackstone to make to drill into the wall of the bank. According to Blackstone, it took roughly a week to come up with the tools and then the three men agreed to meet at 4am one morning to measure out the drain and where they would need to start tunnelling. The wall was about nine feet thick, so they wanted to get it right. They crept silently past Mr Redmond's house careful not to wake anyone up, and dashed stealthily across his backyard to the drain. After lowering themselves inside, they lit their lantern and quietly slid their feet through the mud. Locating the spot where they were to start tunnelling, Blackstone placed some bricks in the mud so they could stand on them whilst working. 
They chipped away at the drain all day and made their exit once it was growing dark. They slipped out of the drain at another exit in Mr Thornton's paddock, which lay opposite the bank. The following week they met again, but this time Blackstone was alarmed to see that Dingle and Farrell had not come alone. They had brought their friend John Creighton with them. Dingle reassured Blackstone that Creighton would be an asset as he was the one who had laid the floor of the strong room. Reluctantly, Blackstone proceeded with Creighton into the drain and began work as the other two stayed outside and kept watch. They worked steadily throughout that Saturday and trudged out into the daylight that afternoon where they informed Dingle and Farrell that they were only one day away from breaking into the bank but would have to wait until next Saturday to break through. Dingle wouldn't hear of it. He wanted them to meet the following day, but Blackstone pointed out that he and Farrell had to be at church muster. Dingle took a deep breath and thought about it for a moment. He was desperate to crack through that wall. They were so close, he could almost feel the money in his hands. But what to do about the muster? If Blackstone and Farrell weren't there for the count, they would be punished, which could mean waiting even longer. Suddenly, an idea popped into his mind. Dingle was mates with the clerk and could ask him if he could excuse Blackstone and Farrell from the church muster. He relayed his idea to the others and told them to start work tomorrow morning. If Dingle could arrange to get them exempted, quote, he would throw a handful of coppers down the grating as a signal, end quote. The men agreed to meet the next morning. Before daybreak the next day, the men crept silently through the streets of Sydney, meeting at the entrance of the drain. There, Blackstone, Farrell and Creighton slipped into the drain, leaving Dingle outside. Dingle had his own tasks to complete before the men broke the wall of the bank. Not only did he have to get Blackstone and Farrell the pass to Miss Church Muster, but he also had to find a way of getting the people he lived with out of the house that night, as the men had agreed that the safest place to take their booty was to Dingle's place. Only 20 minutes after the men started into the drain, they heard the sound of someone approaching them. They immediately stopped what they were doing, hoping that it was Dingle, and called out, Who's there? Val Rourke, came the answer. Who sent you? they cried. Rourke approached the men and told them he had been sent by Dingle. Blackstone was outraged. He could not believe Dingle had told yet another person and fearing that he would get caught, he said he would have nothing more to do with it and turned to leave. Rourke assured him that he could keep his mouth shut Creighton and Farrell pleaded with Blackstone to not leave and pointed out that he had done most of the hard work. If any of them deserved a cut of the riches, it was him. Reluctantly, Blackstone agreed and they carried on. The four men took turns chiselling away until finally they reached the final stone into the vault. At that moment they heard the drums beat, signalling it was time for church. Within moments, Dingle threw the coppers into the drain. Excitedly, they took out the cornerstone. They had made it through. They shone the light through the hole in the wall and quickly debated whether they should enter the bank now or at nightfall. They decided that the time was now. Farrell was tasked with going through the hole in the wall. He was the youngest of the group, aged around 24 and was a much smaller build than the others, so it would be easier for him to climb through. Once inside, he grabbed two ornate japanned tins and some small yellow canvas bags and came back through the hole to show the others what he had found. The japanned tins had locks, so the men broke them open. Inside were notes of various denominations, more money than they had ever seen. Inside the yellow bags were coins, half crowns and shillings. Farrell crawled through into the bank to retrieve more. This time, he returned with a brown Japan tin and a small white tin, containing books without covers. When Creighton inspected the books, he found that they listed the numbers of the notes. They had to be destroyed, 
so the men took the papers and rubbed them into the muddy water, sitting stagnate in the drain. Again, Farrell went into the drain, passing through bags of coins and notes to Blackstone, who passed them to Rourke and Creighton so they could sort the money. They divided the notes into five parcels that were to be put into the hat of each man. This was to keep them off the wet floor of the drain, and later so they could walk through town without raising suspicion. By the time they left the drain, it was evening. They had taken all that they could manage, leaving behind more notes, silver coins, the broken boxes and the tools lying on the floor of the drain. As they headed out, they met Dingle, who had come with some bags to help carry their loot. He told the men to head to his house and let themselves in through the back door, which he had left unlocked. He had successfully got everyone out of the house for the evening and assured them they would not be disturbed. As the men set off, Dingle went into the drain to collect what coins he could. Despite having stolen more money than they would make in their entire lives, some were eager to go back and get more. Blackstone, however, wanted to get home and wash. He didn't want the people he lived with to notice any break from his usual routine, so he made to go. Not long after he returned home, Dingle appeared and convinced him to meet them again later that night. So when the house was quiet, Blackstone slipped out, careful not to wake anybody, and headed back to the drain. Quietly, the men retraced their steps along the drain and plundered more money from the bank. On their way back, they each took turns to climb the wall over Mr Thornton's paddock. When it was Blackstone's turn, he heard a constable questioning Dingle down the lane. Blackstone slid down the wall and instead of heading to Dingle's place, he turned and went in the direction of home. He stashed the box of money he had been carrying under his arm and hid it amongst some stones, then slipped into his home without waking a soul and tried to get some sleep. The next morning, when Blackstone woke up, his mind instantly went to the sequence of events that had occurred the previous night. He was convinced that Dingle and the other men had been apprehended by the constable. Blackstone tried to act as if nothing was remiss and went to his forge to start his duties as a blacksmith. As he worked on creating a new tool, he was surprised when he looked up and found Dingle standing in front of him. When he asked Dingle what had happened... Dingle told him the constable had questioned him, but as he was a free man, he'd let him go. The other men had hidden behind the church with the booty. Blackstone and Dingle made plans to meet at Dingle's house with the money Blackstone had secreted, and they would split the proceeds between all the men. Once the money had been divided, Blackstone took a cut of it to a man named Woodward, who he'd known for some time. Woodward was a convict who was known to be shady. He sold spirits without a licence on the side and was always up for making a quick buck. When Blackstone told him he had an offer for him, Woodward took him into a private room. There, Blackstone carefully unwrapped his silk handkerchief and revealed a large wad of notes. The bank robbery was yet to be discovered, so Woodward had no idea how Blackstone had got his hands on so much money. There was over £1,000 in the handkerchief. Blackstone explained that they had been stolen from the Bank of Australia, but assured him that their numbers had been destroyed. Woodward agreed to exchange the money off him for a profit. Blackstone happily agreed to his terms and headed to muster at the race course. As he approached the race course, he saw Farrell talking to Thomas Turner outside St James Church on Macquarie Street. He continued on and after discovering that there was to be no muster that day, he headed down Phillips Street and was soon joined by Farrell. Blackstone asked Farrell what he had been discussing with Turner and Farrell told him he had given him some of the stolen money to keep him quiet. They headed to the public house and shared a drink before parting ways. Blackstone returned to Woodward several times to collect his money, but was met with excuse after excuse. Blackstone also approached Dingle for the rest of his cut. 
Dingle told him he had been robbed on Parramatta Road, but would go up country and get some of the cash for him. But he never saw any of the money. On September 14, 1829, Blackstone became a free man, but in November was arrested for highway robbery and sentenced to death, which was later commuted to 14 years transportation to Norfolk Island. And there Blackstone's story of the events ended, and he paused as everyone in the jury took in what he had just relayed. Other witnesses were called, and evidence given that supported certain aspects of his version of events. The trial went into the night, and it wasn't until 10 o'clock that evening that the judge began summing up. At half past 12, the jury retired, but returned shortly thereafter with a guilty verdict for Dingle, Farrell and Woodward. For weeks, the barristers argued that the principal witness, William Blackstone, was a convict and therefore his evidence was tainted. Arguments and counter-arguments were hurled back and forth, with the three presiding judges sitting back and contemplating each point. Until finally, on the 23rd of July, 1831, six weeks after their trial, the three men were brought to the court for the fourth time. Woodward was sentenced to 14 years transportation to a penal settlement and much to everyone's surprise, Dingle and Farrell were saved from the hangman's noose and were given life sentences on Norfolk Island. For the next six weeks, Blackstone, Dingle, Farrell and Woodward were all kept on the Phoenix Hulk waiting for the orders to be processed. Presumably, they were kept far apart from each other. On the 1st of September, 1831, Blackstone was taken to the Hyde Park barracks and given his absolute pardon. And at some point, the directors of the bank handed him his £100 and a passport for free passage back to England. He should have got on the next ship, but instead he decided to stay and it wasn't long before he had re-offended and was back before the courts and sent to Norfolk Island, right where his former accomplices, Dingle and Farrell, were. The clerk, James John Wood, who saved Blackstone and Farrell from church muster that day, argued that he should get the rewards, as he had testified against them all at court. He was able to prove that Dingle was associated with Farrell and Blackstone that day. The directors denied his claim but ended up giving him £25 as his evidence did play a vital role in the case. He also made his case to British authorities and in 1833 was awarded a conditional pardon and later, in 1836, an absolute pardon. John Creighton was never arrested for the robbery because he died in a boating accident off South Head in 1829. His wife Anne, who lost not only her husband that terrible day, but also her father, remarried Dingle later that year. In 1833, Dingle made his escape from Norfolk Island by piratically seizing a boat and was never seen again. He was presumed drowned. Poor Anne was made a widow again. Farrell also made several attempts to escape, but was never successful. He was in and out of trouble for the rest of his life. Valentine Rourke, perhaps the smartest of the lot, left the colony and headed to England on board the Midas soon after the robbery. The authorities sent a letter to England for his apprehension, but he was never found. And as for Thomas Turner, it could never be proved that he had anything to do with the robbery, but his petitions for a ticket of leave were repeatedly ignored. And the money? To this day, it has not been discovered in full. A child playing near a well discovered £2,959 hidden under a stone and was rewarded with £148. A small stash of £140 was found in the rafters of a public toilet in the rocks and a bundle of £50 notes was discovered under a rock near Liverpool Street. In 1893, 
a woman went to the authorities claiming that her husband had confessed on his deathbed that the money was hidden near Mrs Macquarie's chair in the domain. So the Premier, Sir George Dibbs, authorised an excavation of the area, but nothing was ever found. But my favourite theory comes from a night fisherman who claims that he saw a mysterious rower slipping in and out of Little Sirius Cove and other nearby coves around the time of the robbery. Could there be boxes of the spoils buried near the water's edge around the small bays on Sydney's North Shore? I like to think so. Thank you for listening to the Convict Australia podcast. If you'd like to show your appreciation and get more involved, there are a number of ways you can. The first is by signing up to Convict Australia on Patreon and you will get some perks like the Convict Australia newsletter. Secondly, leave a review and tell your friends and family. This really does make a huge difference. And lastly, join the Facebook and Instagram group Convict Australia. All the links I've mentioned will be in the show notes. Thank you again. Till next time.